will be redundant or fruitless. But the events of this day illustrate the desperate need and the darkness of the world some of you will enter. The challenges are not only life and death, they are eternal. Know this, Southeastern has prepared you well, and Southeastern will stand behind you every day of your life and your ministry. Much more importantly, you do not take this journey on your own. You go in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the favor of God, carrying the message of Christ Jesus. You are not ill-equipped, unprepared, or defenseless. You will overcome the evil one. So then, the Board of Trustees is proud of you. God bless you. May you go far and do well. Gesundheit. <laughs>
when the burdens of growing up seem to be more than we can handle. There's a verse that's been a reoccurring theme for me throughout this final semester, found in Colossians 2, 6-7 from the message paraphrase. It reads, My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus the Master, now live Him. You're deeply rooted in Him. You're well constructed upon Him. You know your way around the faith, now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living, let your living spill over into Thanksgiving. We've done the work. We've positioned ourselves to move forward into the substance of our life. To take all that we've learned and all that we've experienced and use it to become the men and women of God that we are called to be. But what happens in those moments when stepping into the will of God doesn't seem very clear? Entering college, and for most of the time we spend here, there's a script or a precedent set for us to follow. We arrive on campus as freshmen, full of excitement, and every step of the way, there's something there to explain what's going to be required to us next. In most of my education classes, I learned all about the different theories of learning, how to set up lesson plans, how to meet the needs of diverse students from different backgrounds. There was one thing I heard that never really made sense. Professor Bratton said, there will be times in your classroom when you face situations that are unprecedented and that no textbook could prepare you for. It was one of those things that I again heard, but never really gave much thought to until I was in a classroom of my own. There's a boy in my last class today who had been a little bit of a behavior problem, but nothing more than the norm for a hormonal teenager. In about my third week there, his behavior got suddenly worse. He started, he stopped doing his homework, he started throwing sharp objects across the room, started using language that was beyond selfish and appropriate. <laughs> and it, it all came to a, a, a rise at, at one moment when he stood on his chair and he proclaimed his utter disdain for, for school, for my class, and especially for me. So I, I calmly asked him to meet me in, my, in, in the hallway and I grabbed a referral from my desk and I put on my best teacher voice. And I began to read him the list of things he had done to violate my rules while I was talking to him. He began to tear up, and I, I've encountered students like this before. I thought he was just trying to build my sympathetic side, so I kept on with my brush. And I looked at him, and I listened more, and then I said, listen, this behavior is so, so disappointing. You're much, much better than this. And then he started to really cry. So, of course, I stopped, and I asked him, what was really going on? And he looked at me with tears welling up, pouring out of his face. He said, uh, before you got here, I was just released from jail and probation. And if I get any behavior notices, they'll immediately take me back to jail. See, this was something I was completely unprepared for. No textbook or lecture I had ever heard prepared me for that moment. Who can teach you how to hold a student's freedom in your hands? I looked at him with tears rolling up in my own eyes, and I said, look, I said, I, I believe in you. Okay, I care far too much about you to let you slip away like this. So I'm going to keep the referral on my desk. I'm not going to use it again until... Your behavior warrants it. He looked at me with just the biggest smile and he said, he said thank you, Mr. Dan. I promise I'll change. I won't break any of the rules ever again. And of course, I anticipated that he might, but we walked back into class. <laughs> and for the next week and a half, he didn't break a single one of my rules. He acted like a straight-A student, and he led the class in the discussions. It was awesome. A couple days after that, he came running into my classroom on my lunch break. And he said, Mr. Deck, Mr. Deck, you're not going to believe what just happened at lunch. I said, what? He said, my lawyer came to visit me in school. He said, all the charges against me are being dropped, and I'm not going to jail. See, what started out as an unprecedented challenge from my faith ended up with a result better than I could have imagined. When we walk out of this building tonight as graduates, we will undoubtedly face moments that no textbook could prepare us for. But I believe we as a class will be remembered for being deeply rooted in Christ, well constructed upon his word, and when the time comes for us to face whatever life may bring, we will step forward and seize that opportunity that God has given us. The time for studying is now over. Now it's time to live it. And let your living spill over into Thanksgiving. Class of 2012, well done. We have completed this portion of our life. Now step, now step out and live confident in who you are and who you will become. Thank you. so much. Well done. Well, it is a privilege for me to introduce our commencement speaker this evening, Dr. Dick Foth. Dr. Foth spent much of his early career 
working with and around college students. In fact, he planted a church adjacent to the University of Illinois, pastored a wonderful congregation of students. He also served as the president of Bethany College, Assemblies of God institution in Northern California. Dr. Foth has also spent a number of years working in Washington, D.C., encouraging political and business leaders of faith, and he's done that under the auspices of, of the House and Senate breakfast groups. He also serves on the teaching teams of Timberline Church in Fort Collins, Colorado, National Community Church in Washington, D.C., and Willamette Christian Center in Eugene, Oregon. I will tell you this, I think you will also discover it tonight. Vic Foth is probably one of the most relational leaders that I've ever met in my entire life. He's been a great inspiration to me and encouragement, and I know he will be to all of you tonight, graduates. So would you please welcome Dr. Vic Foth. Southeastern. Thank you to the leadership team of this administration, the faculty and staff who have framed this environment. Thank you students for all that you have done in helping this community be what it is. When you're a speaker like this, you walk in and you feel the atmosphere. You pick it up like that. I like the feeling you guys like each other, and this is very good. The only hard part for me is having to follow Carrie Depp, Corey Depp. Corey, tremendous. I think we should hear it for one more time. <laughs> At this moment, this is what I know. <laughs> My talk is the only thing standing between you and your opponent. <laughs> so I feel a little like that preacher who got up and said, I, I have so much to say, I don't know where to begin. The little kid in front of us said, why don't you start somewhere near the end? <laughs> <laughs> 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, I sat there. I had four masted dreams and was a wee bit scared. 20 years ago, when I stepped down as president of Bethany College, I spoke to the graduating class. I was taking a year of self-imposed sabbatical. I was 50 years old and trying to figure out what to do with the last half. <laughs> and uh, people would come and say, what are you going to do, President Foth? And I would give them the Abrahamic response from Hebrews, where he didn't, you know, he didn't know, he just followed it. And I would give him the faith response. I don't know. <laughs> and when I said that, the whole graduating class said, yes! <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing either. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight as a grandfather. I'm about to complete my 71st trip around the sun. <laughs> Ruth and I will complete 50 years of marriage in July. Wow. We have four children and 11 grandchildren. <laughs> we have 11 grandchildren from ages 21 to 3. <laughs> when I look at you and your generation, some of you here are younger than others. Some of you are here, you transferred in after a couple of years in a city college, and others are here on the four year plan, and some are here on the seven-year plan. You know. <laughs> but your generation, generally, your generation is the first generation in history that has not had to go to an authority figure for information. There will be more new information, new knowledge generated this year than in the 5,000 years preceding this year. That's overwhelming. I talked to six Colorado State University students that helped me with some stuff last Saturday morning. And I said, what's the challenge for you? And they said, everything's changing. We have all these options. We're paralyzed by options. Everything is changing. We don't know where to land. And I asked myself the question, how do you deal with the anxiousness that comes when so much change is occurring? I believe at the core of all of this, there's a desire to connect and to achieve. And that's not dissimilar from my generation. Some of you here come from broken places, broken homes, like I do. Some of you here have had challenges, stress points in your life like I did. I stuttered from the age of five to the age of 28. 
stutter terribly or, or well, depending on how you view that.